Our guest in this segment <laughs> is Senator Patricia mm-hmm. Rucker. Good morning, Senator. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> have you been to Antigua lately? I have not, and I would love to go. It's beautiful. Now, you're from Venezuela, correct? Yes. Have you been back to Venezuela since you left? Last time was 2001. 2001. Yes, and that's because it, things have become too dangerous, unfortunately. Now, I have heard recently that things are improving enough. Um, tourism is starting to pick up, and some folks are safely traveling and enjoying themselves, but um, I have not taken that that trip yet. Have you, do you have family there? Yes, most of my family still remains in Venezuela. I have a few who have immigrated to the United States and a few to Spain, but the vast majority have stayed in Venezuela. Are they doing okay? It depends on your definition of okay. They're surviving. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's pretty much what everyone says, we're surviving. That's what you do. Is the threat physical, economic? Everything. Social what? Everything. everything. Um, okay. So, you know, employment is almost gone completely. So people just depend on what the government gives them. And you can never know what that's going to be. So every single week, you have a day in which you are allowed to go to the store and they give you your little bag of whatever it is they have. And you never know how much that is. It usually encompasses a little bit of protein. So there might be a little chicken or it might be a little fish or a little something, um, some grains, some rice. Um, maybe you'll get some uh, vegetables, but it is essentially just everyone getting this very, very tiny amount, and it's only once a week. So the only way to really survive from my relative's viewpoint is you have to all come together. So all the members of the family basically just are living together and sharing what they have. And then, of course, there's a thriving black market, which is where most of the things that Venezuela has gets traded. So part of the reason there is so little to give to the citizens is that the very public officials will take whatever's available and they'll rather go to the black market and trade it there than do it through the legal means. So basically the black market is alive and well. How do they uh, participate? How do they buy from the black market since there's no economy? So it's it's a bartering. It's bartering. Okay. So whatever you have excess of, you trade. You try to trade for what you want, and it just goes, you know, that way. And of course, there is still people who do grow things. There is still, um, you know, folks who fish, folks who who do those type of things. Um, and so they have something to trade. And then, of course, there the few jobs that there are. Um, you know, people will buy. They basically, so you work and whatever you get paid, you know, because of inflation, you just get whatever you can get that day. You get whatever is available, no matter what it is, be it toilet paper, be it copper tubing, whatever it is, you just go and buy it because you know that it's more valuable than keeping the, the currency. And then you have something that you try to trade in the black market for something that you actually want. So uh, your relatives, are they still trying to get, have, are they actively trying to get out of, Benz, out of Venezuela? So some of them, yes, but most of them, no, because honestly, it is impossible. They, they, I hate to say that because, you know, I'm a very hopeful and optimistic person, but they, um, it's just impossible. First of all, the government will punish you if you've ever protested against the government. So you will never get a passport. So you would you know, that closes the door right there. Second of all, it's extremely dangerous. Um, Venezuela has the Amazon jungle, you know, underneath it. To one side is Colombia, but you have to go through all the cocaine and narco traffickers. Um, On the other side is also basically impassable. And you had the Caribbean Ocean. So pretty hard to 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 get out if you want to you know immigrate illegally it, it's pretty tough it is happening mm-hmm. and there are venezuelans who do make that trek and it's unbelievable how many actually do go through the amazon jungle to get to brazil for example um but it is a very dangerous thing so if you're old if you're infirm if you're not in greatest of health if you have any other family members you know that you don't want to abandon and you know that they depend on what you can bring in it, it's a very difficult very difficult and tragic. Was it was it uh, substantially different when you were living there, Patricia? Substantially different, yes. Um, I can't even express to you how dramatically different. When Venezuela was, um, a lot of people like to portray it as a third world country, but it was an absolute first world country with first world conveniences, infrastructure. You had supermarkets, just like we do here in the United States, um, thriving economy. The people of Venezuela, um, 
worked and made so did so well that they would travel. They were known as world travelers, um, and they and they essentially were very well educated, and, but they didn't immigrate because they were so happy in Venezuela. Venezuela is like essentially perfect. You have perfect climate. You can grow things year round. It's really unbelievable to me how politics could take that and essentially mm -hmm. turn it into what is a uh, hellhole in you yeah. know, I hate to say it in a graphic yeah. term, but that's what it's become. Why did you, why did you immigrate or your family immigrate? My father got a job in Washington, D.C., and it was supposed to be a part-time job of four years. Um, he's an international correspondent, and he was supposed to travel every four years to a different location. But I've gone through this story before many times. I don't want to bore anyone. But through circumstances, it kept he kept being kept here and by the time that we had been here 12 years we were all teenagers and we we're like we're good dad yeah. you can go wherever you want but we're staying <laughs> and of course I met my husband and yeah. I married him and sure. that's actually the only time I considered applying for citizenship was when I got married because mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to Venezuela until then well that's uh <clears throat> We obviously weren't intended to go down that road, but that was great. I'm not, and I mean this as a compliment. That was an amazing story and uh, tremendous information about your background and also about what's going on with your family in the country of Venezuela that most of us probably were not in, aware of in as much detail. Yeah. So thank you for a so great eye opener there. Uh, speaking of eye openers, <laughs> uh, Monday, <laughs> Delegate Paul Espinosa announced that he is going to run for Senate. And so what has become the real election cycle in West Virginia now is the Republican primary as opposed to the general election. Uh, this will now become a very active primary. And I assume that you will run for re-election. You've announced that previously. So this shapes up as an interesting matchup between you and Delegate Paul Espinosa. Uh, did you two talk before he made that announcement? Were you aware it was coming? Yes, he did speak to me about his um, considering. I didn't know that his announcement was going to be on Monday, but he had told me that he was talk thinking about it. Why do you think you are being challenged? <laughs> well, you would have to really ask him, but um, I will tell you that um, I have faced many formidable opponents in the past. This is nothing new, and I have no problem with challenges. So your thoughts on this challenge? Well, like I said, I, my thoughts are, um, you know, I mean, Paul and I are friends, as he himself said. Um, obviously, it, it, the seat does not belong to me, as he also said, and um, I, I'm... I'm happy to have the opportunity to uh, let the voters decide. You know, I, I, I will tell you that in my personal opinion, um, I have been a very strong voice in the West Virginia Senate. I have demonstrated that I'm not uh, risk adverse. I'm willing to take big risk. I'm willing to push the envelope. It is absolutely um, one of the things that folks know about me, that I will do those tough things, those things that nobody else uh, will do. A uh, perfect example is like the Hilltop House. It was a problem everyone knew. We were going to lose those investors and lose that incredible opportunity for not only our county, state, uh, but the city of Harpers Ferry, which desperately needed it. And someone had to step up and lead and figure a way out. And it is a very politically difficult thing to do because we are for local control, but we needed to find a solution. So with the help of my colleagues, we found a solution and we got that done. And now we're looking forward to that being built. And uh, I just heard last night, looks like it's gonna be open 2025 and that's exciting. But you know, you need someone who's going to be willing to do that, to take those political risks, to be a leader, to solve those issues. And I will tell you that that is simply, um, that's simply who I am. I'm, I'm a mom who just wants to make West Virginia better for her children and for all the children of West Virginia. That's always been something that I cared about. Do you take this challenge personally as a, another Jeffersonian? Is it uh, challenging you? <laughs> no, I, I, I actually don't take it personally. I think it is... Um, it is one of those things that comes with politics. It is unfortunate that politics does get ugly sometimes, does become uh, pitting friend against friend, but uh, that, uh, that is just part of it. I'm not afraid of it, I'm not scared of it, I'm willing to be part of it, and the reason is because it is important enough to do it. Um, when I think about the things that need to happen in West Virginia, like 
there's nothing more important right now in, in my life. And God called me to run in the first place. He has not told me that I'm done, and I don't think I am done. Um, so here I am. Let me let me come at the question a little bit more direct than what Rob did. Uh, the fact that you challenged uh, S Senator Blair uh, for president a, a several at the last last session, uh, do you think that had anything to do with Senator B Blair possibly encouraging Paul Espinosa to run? Challenge. Well, I can't really speculate on, on why Delegate Espinosa chose to run. That's really a question you'll have to ask mm -hmm. him. But I will tell you that, you know, I I did challenge Senator Blair, and I spoke here to you guys as to why I did that. I felt that there were better ways that we could get things done. Um, but again, it was not personal, and I certainly don't think that Senator Blair took it personally. He's told me multiple times, it's like, Patricia, I'm totally okay that you ran. I understand. Um, but here's the reality. We're all different, right? And we all have different gifts and we all have different ways of ex uh, using those gifts. Um, when it comes to getting things done in the West Virginia Senate, you know, I'm very privileged to be where I am and to have been able to be a voice for Jefferson and Berkeley County now for seven sessions. Um, and do I wish some things were different? Yes, absolutely, clearly. But does that mean I'm not able to work within the system that's there? Well, I think I've proven that I can. And this last session was actually one of my most successful sessions out of a very, very effective and successful seven years. And it's because I don't take things personally. And it's not about ego. And it's not about me. It's about finding solutions and getting consensus around those solu solutions. And I've shown that I can do that. I'd like to come back to that, but let's see if Maria has a No, I was, gonna, I was gonna go down a little rabbit hole about uh -oh. how okay. these, how the districts are set up. And because you're both from Jefferson County, I don't know that it would, um, you know, that, that if, if your opponent were from Berkeley County, maybe there'd be a different piece of that. Has this district been redistricted recently? How much of it is Berkeley? How much of it is Jefferson? Okay, so yes, it was redistricted um, in 2020. Um, okay. No, 2022, sorry, 2022. And so my district changed slightly. Okay. It, remained all of Jefferson, which I had before. Mm -hmm. And then the part of Berkeley shrunk, and that's because of population growth. Mm -hmm. And it changed a little bit. So I had this um, very interesting district before that um, we all know was drawn by our you know, great Senator Unger. Um, and now it's a much more condensed um, you know, district, mostly Inwood, the southern part of Berkeley County. Um, I, I still remain a little bit of Martinsburg and, and basically south from King Street. But just so you understand, um, so I will never have an opponent that lives in Berkeley County. Okay. So okay. the way that the Constitution determines um, senatorial districts, um, you cannot have more than one senator living right. in one county. So um, anyone who wants to run against me has to live in Jefferson County. Gotcha. No problem. Okay, okay. thank you. Let's go back to the point you made earlier that you felt that your work in this last session was the best that you've had in seven years. You were very successful in carrying the flag, the banner for charter schools. Uh, and most folks associate you with char charter schools. Uh, you were highly visible during that those sessions. You were less visible this past session. Uh, why do you say you felt last session was probably your most successful? Well, so I'm, I'm counting success in terms of numbers of my bills that actually made it through both houses. So clearly when we passed school choice, which is huge, huge bills and took a lot of energy and time, I couldn't get too many other bills through my focus was on those big bills. Um, this past session, I was able to focus on a lot of different bills and a lot of variety of bills, and I got a lot more done. So 39 bills passed that were I was lead sponsor of. So that's a really huge number. Um, I will also say that in terms of effectiveness, um, so here's one of the you know keys, right? So we are 130. 34 legislators. Out of 134 legislators, um, we get 300 some bills passed. 
if you have a good percentage of those bills with your name on it, that is a sign that you are an effective legislator. You are successful in finding enough people to agree with you to get it enough of those 134 to be able to support what you want to do. So I think like for my definition of success as a legislator, that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about in terms of, you know, my record. I mean, clearly I have a record of a success in school choice. I also champion foster care issues. I also, you know, champion tort reform. Um, I've been a very active member of the health committee and have helped push major legislation when it comes to that. And um, there's a lot more things that I'm very interested in. You know, I already mentioned the Hilltop House, but Eastern Panhandle businesses, helping to get those bills through that um, very specific businesses and the tourism industry have requested us to do. I've been a big advocate for horse racing and the gaming, which is essential in Jefferson County. Uh, so there's a lot more. And, and again, those don't get a lot of play. They don't get become, be as visible, but they actually make a huge difference for our day of life here. Yeah. How do you see the campaign uh, working itself out? You and Paul are both very nice people. And you are very courteous to everyone. That's what you well, like. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Unlike, nice. What, unlike what I've been accused of with the open <laughs> comment with Maria earlier today. But uh, how do you see the campaign um, uh, playing out? What will be the issues? What will be well, the, uh, I, I, I can't really speak as to what is going to come up. But I, I will say that, you know, um, Paul and I did run against each other for a period of time in 2015. Sorry. Um, and, um, you know, and it was very cordial and we respect each other. Well, and I, I expect that's going to be the case. Yeah, no I, I, about it I don't think but, there's yeah. going to be any, you know, personal animosity for on either of our sides. I think, again, um, I'm grateful to be where I am. And if the voters believe that I should remain, I'll be happy to continue to serve. Let me push a little push back a little bit. Okay. What is going to be the wedge uh, between the two of you? You've got to have differences. How will you, during your campaign, what are you going to say that even though Paul's a great guy, these are my views, I'm, I'll be more successful doing this than what Paul will be? So I don't really approach things that way. There are differences. There are things that I support that he does not, clearly. And there are things that he supports that he does not. But I really don't see things as a um, either or. It's a different approach. It's a different, um, I guess you'd say, priorities. And so I, I will tell you, I ran from the very first time as my motto or slogan being um, my special interest is you. I'm not beholden to special interests. I am a mom, like I've said. I am a community leader. I'm someone who, you know, first generation immigrant and Constitution matters a lot to me, um, both the U.S. Constitution and the West Virginia Constitution. I do believe that... Um, I will be emphasizing those things that I consider to be my goals. And I want every child in West Virginia to have a good life here in West Virginia, that West Virginia be a good place to raise a child and for families to be thriving. And I suspect that maybe um, Paul might have a different priority, different things that he focuses on, correct? So I see it more of that versus, oh, we oppose each other in this thing because um, I just I just don't see that happening. Okay. Do, uh, in Paul's legislative record, are there points that uh, are certain issues that, that you will highlight? Um, <laughs> I can't think of any right okay. now, right off the top of my head. But, you know, definitely there are things that um, I know that I, I have not supported that he has and that he has not supported that I have. And But I, I suspect there's not that many. So, um, so what will you focus on then, Patricia? What will you focus on? Um, how will you reach out to this little changing district that <laughs> that um, that has uh, come about? And what do you think is your main focus point um, during this campaign? Well, like I said, I obviously um, children, parents' rights. Um, what what would make us all be um, thriving in our area? But the main 
I mean, I'm the incumbent, so the main thing is letting folks know what my record is and mm -hmm. finding out what they would like to see done. What else, you know, their priorities are, what is inhibiting them, what is in their way. You know, and we've done a lot of regulatory reform. I've led in a lot of those things. We've done a lot of toward reform. We've done education reform. But I definitely believe there's a lot more to do. And one of the things I've been disappointed in, so Republicans have been in power now for, you know, a good number of years. Like, we, 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 we can't keep blaming the past, right? But we have not really shrunk the size of government by very much. We continue to have um, serious deficits in some of the areas that people need help in. And of Such some, as? Like, as you guys know, we're, the child welfare area, mm -hmm. you know, where this past session, you know, we had to fight really hard to do something about the CPS workers and issues, social workers. We need more mental health counselors. And the reality is, it's not like we did something wrong. It's just a very competitive environment. Mm -hmm. And we have got to increase the number of folks that are willing to do that in our area. As you know, the entire team from the Eastern Panhandle has been fighting for locality pay, and we're working on that. And I think we have a way forward, and we've you know, been, been making some progress in some, in some ways, because CPS workers in that bill now will get paid essentially more in the Eastern Panhandle. That's a, that's, a, that's a step in the right direction. But we have had such overwhelming issues when we first got into power. Now we really have to get down to the actual brass. Rob's Does, going to cut me off, but I'm going to ask a quick question. <laughs> you, mentioned, you just cut me off. What are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned uh, uh, reducing government. That's something that's commonly thrown out. It's a campaign uh, uh But it's slogan. really, really Give important. Give me examples. Give me examples. Well, like for... Our population has decreased, but none of our major agencies have gone down in size. Not really any. We've done a little bit, but, but give, it's give been Give me examples very... of what you can reduce or, or eliminate. So I will tell you, like, so for example, okay, okay, we have this huge bureaucracy in DHHR, and yet our services have not been what we know that they have been. We don't have enough of those CPS workers and intake workers, but yet we have this huge number of people in the, in the middle, not the top, not the bottom, and this reorganization that we're gonna do, we're, we, we have got to realize what is it that those employees have been doing, what is it that matters, and what is it that doesn't, because, lots of millions of dollars is going there and yet we're not getting the output yeah the example you used i would argue that it's going to bureaucracy is going to increase as opposed to decrease because you got three agencies now as opposed to one agency well but it's going to be streamlined and we're going we part of mm -hmm. this process that we're going through is figuring out how we can make it be much more accountable. And and that is going to actually, I think, make things work better, not bigger. We hope. Better. We <laughs> in, in regards to uh, not reducing government or uh, not cutting government, Patricia, uh, are we talking about people or are we talking about money? Because if we increase pay, does that count as growing government? So you can make that argument that that would be growing government, but we like, so I'm a free market person, right? You have to pay the wages that are competitive if you want to have the best quality people. And I very strongly advocate for having the best quality people. And that, and if you have locality pay, that's more that's adding to your base, which but, means you, mean, you need more revenue to make that But payroll. if you have people who know and are successful at what they're doing, you're getting a lot more for that money. Yeah. But that, yeah, I yield that. And let's go back to DHHR. Uh, I've been of the belief that you, if you, you have to pay someone uh, enough to entice the right type of person to run an organization is like DHHR. And we're not in a position to pay enough. Well, I, I Unless mean. Unless you're a football coach or a president of the university. <laughs> so I, or basketball coach. Or I, basketball coach, I, yeah. I will, you know, kind of push back a little okay, bit on that, please. Bill. Okay. Because, so. I will tell you, I do not know a single person that goes into those fields because they expect to be millionaires and to have football coach mm -hmm. salaries, okay? Most of the people that do go into those fields is because they truly do want to make a difference. And when I talk to those social workers directly, 
face to face. We're not talking about through the political spectrum. Yeah. They tell me, just let me do my job. Yeah. Do not put all of these regulatory things in the way so that I'm spending all my time doing paperwork instead of actually taking care of people because that's what I want to do. Yeah, I need to clarify. I was sure. not talking about the social workers. I was oh. talking about the head of the, of the department, the head of the organization, well, the one or two people at the very top. So, you know, again, we've discussed that about yeah. the salaries mm -hmm. of the people yeah. at the top, and we do believe that those salaries should be more. And, again, we've increased the salaries of a lot of the top mm -hmm. offices. We do recognize that if you want good quality CEOs and yeah. managers, you do have to yeah. pay for that. Senator Rucker, we are over time as opposed to out of time, <laughs> but I appreciate you coming in. It's always a good conversation with you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in. Senator Patricia Rucker at uh, 905.